a lot of the things that we use in the children's hospital come from research that's uh, conducted um, in the adult uh, world. We're, we're very small. We only have one LINAC, three uh, therapists. I'm the only physician there at the children's hospital. Uh, my colleagues cover me from USC, and we have one uh, dedicated physicist. So um, we started using uh, surface scans about five years ago. So this is kind of the, the arc that we went through. You know, is this technology, is this something that's just nice to have? You know, it's something that we use for patient setup, or is this something that we should have because it's really great for intrafraction uh, patient monitoring? Or is this something that we must have? And I'm gonna leave that as a, as a question at the beginning. And I've heard this said again and again, like with any new technology, you know, there's three things and you just have to choose two. So if it's better, faster, or cheaper, um, you know, the, two of the three, it's gonna take off. So with that said, um, this is a topic that I've been very involved in, and this is one of the slides that came from Astro in the fall, integrating healthcare technology to prevent errors, and some of the experience from Royal. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of background on Royal. So Royal is the Radiation Oncology Incident Learning System. Um, you know, a lot of this work started back in 2000 with the Institute of Medicine report, um, uh, establishing a critical need to reduce patient harm. So um, patient safety organizations began around 2009, and then Royals was established in 2011. And beta testing was around 2013 and 14, which is also around the same time uh, that we remodeled our facility and installed the, the true beam. So this is at the forefront of our minds at, at that time. And so um, and, uh, uh, speaking about technology and radiation oncology, there's various steps, as we all know, consultation, simulation, treatment planning, the delivery, and treatment verification. And in blue are data that is generated at each one of the steps, and in red, um, existing data that uh, is acquired or transferred. And so I've got a box uh, around uh, positioning parameters, and uh, the initial portion of my talk is focused on that. So the... Royal's quarterly reports are really interesting uh, reads, um, at least for me, because these are examples of things that I could totally see us um, you know, pr happening in our, in our clinic. So in the first example, um, one out of four um, fractions was in, um, incorrectly positioned. So there was a misalignment of the patient. Um, and you would think, well, how is this possible? The, there was CBCT that was done, but it was just uh, misaligned correctly. And I can totally see. Um, this issue happening in our clinic. Another example, wrong immobilization device used for treatment. So there were vac lock bags but, uh, for a patient undergoing breast cancer treatment, but th the wrong one was just selected. Uh, you can see that vac lock bags and storage, they're all in a row. It's easy to just pick the wrong one. Um, this has happened elsewhere, and I, I can see this as well. A freckle was mistaken for the setup tattoo, and that would be one of our, you know, big nightmares. Like, oh, we, we set up everything, done everything was done correctly, but we just misidentified our initial setup mark. And the incorrect vertebral body was treated. This is like a biggie. You know, you do imaging, you think you're on the right vertebral body, um, you line up things, but you're just just off. So the, the theme of this is that you, you can do everything really well, but at the same time, you can be on the, in, the incorrect isocenter. So with that in mind, we wanted to think of a method to prevent or try to reduce the frequency of these kinds of errors. So this was definitely a group project, and Alicia, Desiree, Dr. Olch, and I were involved in this, and uh, it's a way for eliminating daily shifts, tattoos, and skin marks. So our take-home points, we basically developed a markless isocenter localization workflow that starts from simulation and goes to treatment. And what we do is we enforce absolute couch parameters. So it does require indexed immobilization devices. And um, in treatment planning, from the user origin to the isocenter, we calculate this using delta couch shift, uh, that function in Eclipse that a lot of people are familiar with. But after we calculate that, we derive the couch position and we put it back into the treatment plan so that the therapists have this from their initial treatment fraction. And so with that, the role of a therapist has evolved from performing shifts. They basically now verify shifts and they do it visually and also with surface guidance or IGRT as well. And so um, it's even longer now, but over a three year period, we've treated over uh, 300 patients, over 5,000 treatment fractions without a wrong site treatment error. Um, we've had some near misses, which I'll go into, but we haven't, uh, none of those uh, near misses have reached the patient. 
So I mentioned that around 2013, 2014, we started uh, remodeling our facility. So we were really cognizant of the, the literature. We did literature searches, group discussions, and we basically thought, well, what, let's do a, a deep dive into um, our processes to try to figure out how we can make our treatments as safe as possible. So we even did an inventory of our, um, of our facility, our staffing, the equipment that we have, the ancillary equipment, even down to like entertainment systems to distract our uh, children while they're getting radiation treatment. So, um, you know, a lot of these ideas are, are, are not ideas that we came up with, but basically are ideas that are adapted from um, other um, modalities. And so um, automated patient positioning, um, Electa had this feature in 1999 um, for, for stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, this is a breakdown of the types of patients that we treat, and the majority are brain tumors followed by sarcomas, uh, neuroblastoma, uh, leukemia, and then um, other diagnoses. So um, not a lot of crossover with what happens in the adult population, but I think some of the themes that um, I'm pre I present can be applied to adults as well. So. Um, ultimately, this is what um, we're, we're developing our technology for. So Darren, a uh, 17-year-old, he had a brain tumor, uh, went through pretty intensive uh, chemotherapy, was actually treated at a different hospital, um, and then at the time of relapse, he transferred his care over to the children's hospital. And this is a screenshot from, his, uh, from a television um, interview that he had. So when patients come in, at his age, he's really old enough to go to an adult facility, but having gone through what he had and uh, transplant and infections and decreased counts, um, sometimes it's very difficult for us to transfer patients to adult facilities to, because of all the coordination that's required. So he required craniospinal radiation, which you know, we all know is one of the most complicated uh, setups in, in radiation uh, therapy. One of the things that is you know, a classic boards question, like how do you match your three fields? And um, we know that proton uh, craniospinal uh, can offer better dosimetry, at least to the organs in the spine. Um, but what do we do for patients that are not able to travel for proton therapy for a variety of reasons, whether it's financial, logistical, or they're just too sick to leave our hospital? So our goal was to do better, to improve the craniospinal um, dosimetry for our, our patients. And this was as an alternative to sending our patients to proton therapy, whether it would be Loma Linda or San Diego, or we've sent patients to, to Texas, Philadelphia, Boston, Seattle. So we, we do send patients out, but this is as an alternative. So this is our initial experience from 2013 to 2015, and about 70% of our patients were, were Medi-Cal, so a lot of these patients would have um, insurance issues um, being sent out of state. And the initial 19 patients, uh, again, almost 70% of them had leptomeningeal dissemination, so these were the most high risk of our patients. And 90% of them were treated with anesthesia, and quite a few had re-radiation after prior um, radiation to the brain. So just to highlight that these were the highest risk of our patients when we first started out. And um, with VMAT CSI, we had a lot of open questions about how to utilize this um, procedure and, and technology and process, and we were very concerned about um, the junctions and either causing overlaps or under dosages, and so we wanted to minimize the number of, of matches. So we first started out with two isocenter plans, and then we moved on to, to three isocenters. So uh, this is Dr. Olch. Um, this is also from that same segment, and in the background you can see one of uh, his craniospinal plans. And um, our setups are slightly different, so we don't use uh, face masks, either the open face mask or um, actually any aquaplast face mask. We use a, a vacuum-assisted mouthpiece system, and this is Dr. Olch demonstrating that. And in the background you can see um, our head immobilization device along with the um, body fix vac log bag. So um, this is Darren, and he's with Alicia. Alicia is one of our uh, star therapists, and she went from a, a skeptic, not quite a hater, but a skeptic of surface guided radiation, and now she's one of our strongest advocates. So she, here she is uh, setting Darren up. And this is um, Darren putting in the, the mouthpiece himself, so just showing that it's a comfortable device. And again, this is not something that we um, designed on our own, but um, something that was dis uh, described in the literature back in the, the 1990s. So, 
Uh, again, this is uh, Darren getting into position. And so I want to show basically what the transition was. So on the left, you can see our prior workflow. We used skin marks. We didn't tattoo, but we did, we did mark our patients. And then um, the therapists were, very, uh, were responsible for the, the shift. So was, they played a very key role, matching the brain fields to the spine field. And we used MV imaging at that time. And then after 2013, we went markless. Um, so we used absolute couch positions from the treatment planning system. And our therapists now use the auto go function. And we use surface guidance and KV uh, comb beam CT um, to, to confirm our, our positioning. And so the next couple of slides, I just want to show how we do it. So we use index immobilization. So we use these bars that um, correspond to notches in the couch top. And then uh, there's a white fixed portion, the dog bone that sits on top of, of that crossbar. And then uh, the body um, fixed bag sits on top of that. Um, once that's indexed in position, uh, we know where it is relative to the couch. And so with the digital couch readout, for example, um, on the uh, QFIX um, KV portrait S-frame on the left, uh, I, I show the blue lasers running through the, the pins on that S-frame. And so on the digital readout, uh, you can see that it corresponds to 68.8 uh, centimeters. And likewise, on the right, if we were using the dose max couch top, um, depending on which notch we're lining up to, we have a different measurement. So uh, at H2, for example, we read um, a longitudinal value of 112 centimeters. So let's say we're setting up for a, um, a brain tumor treatment. On the left of the patients on the QFIX portrait S-frame user origin, which corresponds to those pins. So we know the lateral is zero, the vertical is zero, and the lo uh, longitudinal is 68.8 centimeters. And then on the right, during treatment planning, the dosimetrist or physicist, they can place the plan isocenter wherever they, they would like, wherever it makes sense. And then um, using the delta couch shift um, editor position, uh, sorry, function, uh, they can calculate the shifts that would be required to get from the pins to the treatment isocenter. And the extra step that we take is knowing that you're starting from 0, 0, 68.8, you can calculate that you're going to end up at 0.57 minus 11.83 and a longitudinal of uh, 66.07. Part of the reason we, we came up with this strategy is that our therapists are you know, very numbers oriented and it's kind of a little game for them and every time they treated a patient they would say, you know, well, Darren, his numbers are always this and they would always, they would know that. And then this other patient, their numbers are this and it was just a little game. So we thought backwards, well, if the numbers are almost always the same each and every day, what if we just gave you the numbers before the very first fraction? And so that, that's what we do now. So we put the numbers directly embedded into the treatment plan. And so in this case, this approach works for tumors in the uh, brain, head and neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. So if we're doing this for craniospinal and there are three isocenters, then we just embed the couch positions for each of the three isocenters directly in the plan. And so if it works for craniospinal, it also works for you know, brain tumors, a Hodgkin's, a, a pelvic Ewing sarcoma, it, it, it's all the same. Um, so this, um, once we have these couch parameters embedded, we can use auto go to each isocenter location. So I was trying to explain like auto go to my parents and like, what, what the heck is that? And so I told them, hey, it's like our minivan. You know, you just hit the driver memory uh, seat function and it just goes to the, the seat position. So it's the same thing. You press that button on the pendant and it goes to the right position each and every time. Actually, that's not quite right, because we r ran into an incident where we pressed the autogo function, but we didn't hold it down long enough, and it never reached the full uh, position. So um, the therapists are positioning Darren, and you know this is only for the TV audience, because we know that we just use autogo, but that's not very uh, interesting for TV. So here they are <laughs> positioning him. And so moving on to a different type of case, uh, this is an extremity case where we're not um, treating someone in the standard position, so he's reversed. Now he's feet first supine. So similarly, we've built a, 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 a vac lock bag to immobilize, immobilize his foot, and he's, he's flipped. So um, we set a, a zero at the time of the CT simulation. So in treatment planning, um, we set up um, the 
user origin, which corresponded to a 0, 0, and 103 on the longitudinal. Um, the dosimetrist set up a plan, uh, I think it was VMAT in this case, and they established an ISO center, and then using the same type of calculation that we did, which is now embedded into an Excel spreadsheet, um, we derived numbers of 1.29 minus 4.09 and 100.94, and so those numbers are entered, I don't know if you can see this, no, they're entered into the uh, box below that's uh, circled in red. And so that's what the therapists have. And then we also give them a shift sheet to do a, a double check of our, our calculations. So, um, usually works correctly most of the time, but on the picture on the left, you can see that at the time of CT simulation, we didn't notice this, but we intended to set our zero at H3, which corresponds to 98 centimeters on the, in the linear accelerator. But actually, if you look at the blinking yellow arrow, we were actually off of that. We are off by five centimeters. Fortunately, a sharp dissymmetrist and physicist picked this up at treatment planning, so we are able to adjust. Um, but on the right, what you see is a reenactment. Like, what if, so we took this and said, well, what if we didn't notice this? And what if we said our user origin was H3 when it really wasn't? Uh, and we went all the way to treatment. What would have happened? Well, so we did this. We, we, we talked to the patient and said, hey, would, would it be okay if you did a little experiment with us? And if we set you up incorrectly? He was like, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, so we did that. And you can see surface guidance, in this case, would have saved us. Because right there, you can see that, that big red bar. And it's off by five centimeters, which tells us, hey, something is wrong. So this is a, a key example. And that, that helped turn our the tide of the opinion, like, whoa, this is really something that could save us. And so anyway, this going back to that teenager, so in that case, over 30 fractions, we treated him for a Ewing sarcoma. Um, our average shift was 2.3 millimeters. So you know, we weren't trying to do, you know, as we weren't trying to do anything stereotactic. This was just um, a VMAT case, pretty routine. We had some bolus against his foot. But if you look at the translational and rotational shifts, the, his setup was, was remarkable. So a couple of examples of um, cases um, for SGRT in our facility and thoughts, my thoughts on how this might apply to um, the adult um, institutions. So another case, case from Royal. So this is a case where a patient needed to be treated to multiple sites. So sometimes this comes up. So a clinical sim was done. We were trying to treat um, skin cancer treatments, and there were eight sites. So the simulation was done um, using their standard procedures. The physician drew eight treatment fields, and then um, the Therapist took photos of the, the sites. And everything there sounds like pretty standard, something that we would do as well. And then there was a, a delay between the, the simulation and when the treatment started, and treatment sites one to four were treated correctly. But then um, on the very first day for uh, treatment sites five to eight, it was also done correctly. Um, but one of the sites wasn't remarked because the patient had put ointment. Uh, and the markings were a little, were ineffective, and that reading through that, I'm like, I thought, well, that was our old process. We didn't tattoo. We used uh, markers. And teenagers, you know, they don't like marks. They would always try to rub them off. So this is something that very well could have happened to us. Um, what's a little bit different in this case is that they had uh, multiple machines. We only have one LINAC. But the next fraction, there was another therapist on a different machine. So one of the sites was treated incorrectly. And then the fraction after that went to yet a third, uh, went onto a third machine and was treated incorrectly. And then on the fourth fraction, went back to the originally treating therapist, and the therapist noted that that site was treated incorrectly. So this is something that you know, happens in our um, patient population as well, where we're treating multiple sites. So we thought, well, how can we try to mitigate these types of errors? Because I can see that happening as well. So. Um, one of the things that we do is we treat um, bone oligometastases. Um, there's a COG clinic, uh, clinical trial, and the question is, 
uh, do patients have better outcomes if we treat all of their uh, oligometastatic sites at the end of chemotherapy, so for more aggressive and consolidating treatments. So in this case, we treated five different sites. And so it, it, it's not skin, but it's SBRT, and it's kind of a similar issue. If we're treating five different sites, is it possible that we would uh, treat a site incorrectly? So we think that one, well, by embedding the couch values, it's probably less likely, and then supplementing with surface guidance on top of that, that also further reduces it. So this is a timeline that I took from our um, from, from ARIA, and at the very bottom, you can see the different types of imaging that we did. So we did um, a CBCT, we confirmed after we did touch-up shifts, and then we treated the patient, and then we also did um, uh, exit dosimetry as well for, for quality assurance. And then to move on to the next site, we just used the auto go function and went on to the next site. So this patient, we treated five sites. We treated a vertebral body, humerus, two sites in the skull, as, and then also the sacrum. And so um, five sites, five fractions, and our treatment times ranged um, a median of 75 minutes, so basically an hour and 15 minutes, but we, also, we were able to finish in under an hour. So if you look at how we treated this patient, we first started treating his T2 vertebral body, then his humerus, then we moved on to uh, his head, and then finished with the sacrum. So we were kind of jumping around at different portions of his body. And on the longest fraction, we realized that <clears throat> One of the issues was that uh, he had just finished chemotherapy and he was very nauseated. And I showed you our uh, mouthpiece before, and that mouthpiece was contributing to his nausea. So that on that day, it, it took much longer because we had to let him sit up. Once he felt better, we set him back up again and finished treatment. So um, when we figured out that, oh, that was the cause, we moved his head treatments to the very beginning. Once we finished that, we removed the mouthpiece and then treated the other sites. So once we did that, we were able to finish in under an hour. So now for SBRT, oftentimes we're finishing, oh, 15 minutes is a good benchmark for us. So, um, and oh, going back one slide. So this is something that we hear more from the adult um, research trials that, that I've been reading about treating oligometastatic disease. And so um, I think that this methodology could apply in, in that um, scenario. One thing that we've also learned from our adult colleagues at USC, they started doing DIBH well before we did. Uh, we don't treat breast cancer, so the only uh, patients that we treat for DIBH would be either Hodgkin lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's, which is not that common. Um, they're more, more commonly treated with uh, chemotherapy, so we rarely see them. But we do use surface guidance to ensure that we're setting up these patients properly. So this is a, a really cool example in my mind because he's a, he's a tall, lanky kid, teenager again, and he was a trumpet player. So oftentimes when we ask kids to do deep inspiration breath hold, it's, it's not very impressive. It, it's kind of like me, I'm an asthmatic, so when I take a deep breath, like nothing really changes. Um, but this guy, he went from 3.3 liters to 4.8 liters, and you can see on the coronal where his diaphragms moved. It was really impressive. And so um, it made a, a big difference in terms of, of his um, uh, uh, dose constraints to his lungs and to his heart. And so I think that this is something that could also apply to adult patients. And finally, the third um, use case that I think is really neat in um, PEDS that also has applications to the adult population um, are cases when we treat kids who are either um, very young and have situations where they can't receive anesthesia or they're just non-compliant. So I think of patients that I treated. The, the youngest patient I treated was less than a month old. And then the oldest patients that I've ever treated, not, not at the children's hospital, um, but in, in my prior career uh, treating um, both kids and ad adults was 104. Um, and then the oldest patient I've treated at the children's hospital was about 45, um, very young. So since I'm older than that now. Um, but this is an example of a kid who was diagnosed when he was 18 months of age. He had Wilms tumor. So he had uh, surgery, chemotherapy, we treated his flank. Then, unfortunately, he relapsed in the lungs. So at that time, um, we treated his whole lungs after uh, chemotherapy. Those both of those first two treatment courses, we used anesthesia because at that time he was under two years of age. So unfortunately, after that, he relapsed um, with the mediastinal mass and had surgery, and then was on a, a chemotherapy clinical trial. And then shortly after that, he progressed again in the mediastinum. And so, at that point, he was still under four years of age, so he was still really young. 
Um, we typically use anesthesia for patients that are seven or eight or younger. Once they're about eight, then we, we talk to them and see if we can get them through treatment without anesthesia. So in this case, he presented with this huge mediastinal mass that you can see in uh, panel A, and that was one week before our simulation. And at that time, we had talked to the surgeons already because the surgeons had resected a mass previously, and so this would mean going back into the chest for another operation. We also talked about different chemotherapy options, and both of the options of chemotherapy and surgery were, were deemed not possible. And so we thought about doing um, radiation treatment. Um, it, it took qu us quite a while because when we talked to our anesthesiology colleagues, they basically said, no, no way. This is a kid who's very young, um, has this huge mediastinal tumor. Um, when you're younger, your, uh, your trachea is floppier. Um, once you put someone under anesthesia, they lose muscle tone. This kid is never going to get extubated. So we went around and around about this, and we thought, okay, there's no way we're going to be able to sedate this patient. And then so we finally simulated the patient without anesthesia, and that was very, very rough. We basically laid the kid down. We, we built out a mobilization device, obviously not, not a great one because he was, very, he was fighting us. And we would let him sit up because he had a lot of air hunger. So we'd sit up, breathe a little bit, then we'd lie him down again. So we would do the scout, let him sit up, take a break, and then lie him down again. Then we got the scan done but it took much longer than, than we expected. So we thought, okay, this is a circumstance where surface guidance would be really helpful because you know, there's no way that we could image this patient and then treat him because he's, he's gonna need a break between that. So what we did is we imaged the patient, we took a, a monitor, we took a reference image in surface guidance, looked at the reference images, made sure that we were covering what we needed to cover, and in this case, we just used a single AP field, 10X FFF, because we wanted to make this as short as possible. Um, but I, and I think that without surface guidance, we wouldn't have been able to treat this patient in the same way. I mean, sure, we could have just used really big fields, but that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so with um, surface guidance, we were able to treat this patient. And then you can see a month after we treated him, the mass uh, in panel C significantly smaller than in panel B. But unfortunately, we gave 20 and 5. Unfortunately, about three months later, the mass grew again. Um, what was interesting was interesting in a sad way was that he developed a, a concurrent infection at a different hospital, and he was intubated at that time, and then transferred back to our hospital. And when he was intubated, the uh, ICU team tried to wean him off. Uh, the ventilator, but they couldn't because the mediastinal mass had uh, increased in size again. And so at that time. Um, we had long discussions with the family, and the family really wanted to take him home. That was the goal. He had an older brother, about six years old, and he wanted to, the family wanted to take Joey back home. And so we offered um, palliative radiation, eight gray, two, two, uh, four, four times two, just to get him off the ventilator. And um, we actually were able to do that. It, it shrunk with, with just eight gray. And then he went home, and I think he passed away about, about four to six weeks later. So he, he actually had some benefit from that um, additional course of treatment. What's interesting to me is that um, I, we timed the amount of time it took to treat him. So this is from the time of imaging. So from the time of imaging, not including the, the setup that, that comes before that, but once we imaged and then treated him using SGRT for the five fractions that we did, it was four to 10 minutes. When he was intubated and under anesthesia, you would think, okay, now we've got a controlled situation. It actually took us longer. And this is starting from the time he was imaged, so it didn't count the time it took us to move the ventilator, get him set up, you know, I'm not, I'm discounting that. So that took us 17 minutes. There's only two fractions, so it's hard to draw real strong conclusions, but it really made us think, you know, SGRT really does help out our processes. So um, text is kind of small, so there's definitely some uh, limitations and challenges to this uh, methodology. First of all, I think, and I think on the agenda I saw a, a talk uh, about this as well. There are definitely culture, cultural changes and acceptance is required by the entire team. You can't do this alone. Um, everybody was involved. Um, one of our therapists had a great quote, but I'm um, getting far-sighted now, so I can't read her quote here. But, oh, there it is. It's, it's basically, uh, it's a gift to therapists because um, we're always, um, in, in the right ballpark, and so that, that was one of the goals. So whether it, and we do this even in emergent cases, we use the same workflow. We try not to deviate from that. So if it's an emergent brain, we do the same thing, so the therapists have more confidence in, in, in the work. 
and it's an, al an alternative option to eliminate shifts, well, you can just set the plan ISO center at simulation, which can be done for many types of sites that people treat, like prostate or breast. You can set an ISO center. It's just not practical for what we do, because, for example, for treating craniospinal, it's just not practical to set two or three ISO centers and expect that they're going to be in the right area. Or for treating five oligomets, we just can't set that at the time of sim. Um, so. We, we need to use index and mobilization devices. Um, this doesn't apply to treatments that we do that are non-indexed. So we don't do this, for example, for a keloid patients where we're just doing electrons or heterotopic ossification. We don't, we don't do this. And uh, we, don't, we won't do this for total body irradiation. Although we have ideas of maybe utilizing surface guidance for that as well, but that's a, that's a research idea. Um, so this workflow was established for TrueBeam with ARIA and Eclipse, and if people are using different forms of equipment or different software packages, it might not quite apply. And it reduced, but it didn't totally eliminate near misses. So you can see that you can misidentify the user origin, the math can be done incorrectly, it might not hold the auto-go function down long enough. Um, and so large shifts are still possible because um, image guidance still overrides our predetermined couch shifts. Um, and it's hard because of all the constant changes that we've been doing to systematically evaluate the effect of each one of our changes. So in summary, we developed a markless isocenter um, workflow that takes us from simulation to treatment using um, enforced absolute couch positions, index and mobilizations, um, uh, devices, uh, embedded couch values, and the auto-go function are very key in our, in our um, workflow. The user origin to isocenter shifts are calculated, and then we use Excel now to, to make sure those uh, shifts are calculated correctly. And the role of the therapist has really evolved. Um, they can still perform shifts based on image guidance, but now they're using a lot more automation, and um, they're basically focusing on the patient, and they're utilizing higher cognitive functions. It's not about making shifts anymore, at least in, in our workflow. And overall, the, the, the confidence has uh, really increased in our, our clinic for doing things that are really complex. And so over the three years when we studied this, um, 300 patients were treated, 5,000 treatment fractions. We had near misses, but we didn't have any wrong site treatments. And ongoing um, quality improvement processes have added QA checks. One of the key things is surface guidance. Um, so. And beyond that, we've started to use that for DIBH and for patients who are unable to remain still, as I mentioned. So, um, so that's near the end of my talk, but wanted to um, give another shout out to another very important mother in my life, and that's my wife. So my wife uh, and I are shopping for a new minivan. And so um, as we were shopping for a new minivan, she drove my old car. And so she just sent me this text um, a couple of days ago when I was prepping my slides, and she said, it's hard driving without the backup camera. I feel blind. So I said, well, now I'm going to include that statement in here. But I think that that sentiment basically applies to surface guidance. So I don't know if that answers the question in your mind about whether this is a must-have technology. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge the group of people that I work with at CHLA and USC and all the residents and students who have come by because they've all contributed to um, our, our work by asking questions. So no dumb, there are no dumb questions. Um, so, and that's. that's